<clears throat> All right, everybody, welcome to today's daily sketch grind. Excited to see you guys here. Um, let's jump in. All right, so um, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I have Caleb with me here. He's going to be moderating the chat. Um, he's my new assistant. He'll also be um, moderating the Sketch Grind Facebook group and stuff like that. So um, everyone say hi to Caleb for me. He'll be reading off your questions so I can focus on drawing without having to stop every few minutes and stare at the chat. So um, today uh, we're going to be, so we decided we're going to be doing every other day is going to be a reference study and then going back and forth between reference and um doing the prompt. So today's reference that I'm doing, I'm going to be drawing some cats. You can do whatever reference you want. It's up to you. Be sure to post your work in the sketch grind group. Um, I didn't get around to doing any Instagram stuff yesterday for it, but I am, I've made it a priority to make sure I get it done today. So be sure to post on Instagram with hashtag sketch grind. And let's get started. Um, so these are the reference photos I found. We'll see if we get to all three of them, but this is what I'm going to start with. And as usual, we're going to start with some warm ups, just drawing whatever it is we want to draw, messing around. Um, so let me set a timer here. And for 10 minutes, actually, we decided we were going to do five minutes because it was yeah. a long time to warm up and we felt like we needed more time for drawing. So five minutes, timer is going. And let's start uh, Let's start doing some warm ups. Do we got any questions in the chat yet? Just people saying hi. Not yet. All right. I think one of these times I do reference studies, I should practice drawing some trees and rocks. I always do animals, but I could use some work on some vegetation stuff, I think. Just talk a little bit louder probably so you guys can hear me. <clears throat> Sometimes when I'm drawing and I get like in some of my older courses, I'll be like talking and I get really focused and I start talking quieter and quieter until <laughs> I'm like whispering and basically sound like I'm mumbling to myself. Just get so focused. Anybody, uh, <clears throat> anybody seen Bandersnatch on Netflix? I watched it yesterday with my little brother and man, that was. That was a trip. That was pretty crazy. It's a little bit dark, so probably not for everyone, but if you like Black Mirror stuff, man, it was pretty awesome. So we have a comment. I'm so bad at trees, plants, and buildings, and I really need to practice them. What are some things, uh, for example, with this tree that you're drawing, what are some things that you've noticed in your studies of trees and plants that you could share? Um, I honestly have done pretty much zero studies of trees and plants, like actual hard art studies where I'm looking at reference and drawing it. This is mostly just kind of like uh, I think I've seen a tree that maybe kind of looks like this that I think looks cool. Um, but I haven't done any actual studies. But if I was, I, I mean, when I do, which I plan on it, I'll probably just go where I always go, which is Pinterest. Find some really cool pictures of trees or take my own pictures. I went to the Natural History Museum on Monday or Sunday, like I mentioned, and I took a bunch of pictures that I'll probably use at some point for reference. Um, but... I would go to Pinterest. I haven't used reference for painting trees and stuff because 
for a long time, I never really needed to paint trees, but it's probably would be a good thing for me to learn better so my trees look more realistic. Because, I mean, this doesn't look bad, but it uh, doesn't look quite like a real tree. I think I, I think a big thing that would help if I did some studies of trees is seeing how the branches shoot off and how those actually work instead of kind of guessing. Um, studying the bark, like the directions in which it grows and stuff. But yeah, how the, uh, how the leaves shoot off of the branches and stuff like that, what it actually looks like instead of just kind of trying to come up with my own thing. So, sorry, can't tell you a, a bunch on that because I haven't done it a whole lot yet. I mean, you can still, even if you haven't done a studies of something before though, if you've done studies of enough other things, you just start to get the hang of form and you can sort of think about things three-dimensionally and kind of imagine what it is shaped like based off of what you understand a form. So, I mean, a tree is essentially a cylinder for the most part, the smaller cylinders coming off of that. And if you can visualize that, I think you would be, I mean, that's how I'm kind of, it's not a great tree, but it's, you can tell it's a tree. <laughs> At least I hope so. So hope that answers your question as best I can. Some exciting news, at least for me, I think it'll be exciting for you guys, is that I have been contacting other YouTubers to do some collaboration videos. I have about four people. All right, there's a warm up time. Let's draw some cats. All right, so I have about four people who um, have said yes, that they're interested and we're, good. we're figuring out what we're gonna do, what kind of video we wanna do. So you guys have any ideas? For collaboration videos, let me know. One of the ideas he has to play like the drawing game where we both take turns adding onto a drawing or um, doing something where we um, each draw a picture and then exchange pictures and paint each other's line art, something like that. But uh, or maybe even just talking about a topic. I'm not sure yet, but uh, yeah, that'll be exciting. I don't want to say who yet in case they end up wanting, because we haven't finalized when we're going to do it and what we're going to do. And I don't want to pressure any of them into feeling like I'm forcing their hand because I committed them to all my followers. But when, as soon as, as soon as I can, I'm going to, we're going to do it and post it live, or I guess not live, but put it out on YouTube. So hopefully this month, I'm hoping. get uh, make my brush size a little bigger actually you know i saw some stuff in the group and i wanted to try painting or drawing with this round brush i want it to get too uh painty i, I don't want to look too much like a painting i want to keep it like a drawing but i think that we can do that with this brush and still keep it like a drawing so i'm going to try that I saw this cat on Pinterest and I just liked it so much because it looked so, it looks like a cartoon, <laughs> but it's like real. I just thought it was so funny. I was like, I gotta draw that. What are you guys working on today? What's everyone doing for reference? Someone says faces. Nice. Caleb is actually really good at drawing faces. You guys should check it. He has a website. Was it Caleb Saran Arts? CaleBSaran.com. CaleBSaran.com. That's C E R A N. Yeah, he did some pretty good faces. Great portraits. 
Another one says Aaron Blaze's dogs. I have not even seen those. That sounds cool, though. <laughs> like, as in Aaron Blaze's course on, like, canines? Or, like, you found <laughs> pictures of his dogs online <laughs> and you're kind of creepily drawing them? <laughs> I think this brush is too big for this. I feel like, or at least I'm just not doing a very good job. Someone is asking, I want to make a comic book about Onis and war. It needs to go through a lot of development before I even start it. Mm -hmm. I do have a rough idea of the storyline. Are there tips on when designing characters and surroundings? Yeah. What, can I make a request that you um, just read off their names when you read yeah. the comments so I yeah. know who it is? Sure, that's Sayoko. Okay. Um, so you're wanting to know tips on designing the characters? Um, I would say, I'm going to use my pencil brush, by the way. Um, for designing characters, um, well, it's going to depend, I think, on the tone of the comic. Is it going to be like really dark and gritty or more like lighthearted and adventurous? You know, like, do you have like a comparison maybe? Like, do you want it more like uh, Hellboy feelings uh, where it's like kind of a dark gritty with like a dark humor to it? Or do you want it like, you know, Spider-Man comics or, uh, you know, it just kind of depends what it is what you're going for, I'd say. Then I can answer a little bit better if I had that information. Well, Sayoko's uh, answering that. Um, we've got other people saying that they're drawing faces. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got people drawing um, from the canine course. So that's the that answer to that oh. question about okay. Aaron Blaze's Sweet. dogs. Um, not creepily drawing his actual pets. Um, uh, someone else is drawing. Let's see. George French is drawing hands. Nice. Hands are difficult. Yes. That's a great one to study. Sayoko says it's going to be really dark and about murder. I'm thinking about making most of them quite wide and muscular, but what's your opinion? Um, are the Onis bad guys? Are they like the protagonists or the antagonists? Like, are they supposed to be the main villains? Either way, you can make them wide and muscular. That's totally fine. But you would take a completely different sort of design route if you were making them kind of your villains than if you were going to be having them be the hero characters. Um, I don't know. I think this is the thing. There's a lot of like rules for character design, but then there's also a lot of great stuff that breaks a lot of those rules. Like for example, typically you want your main character to have pupils and eyes so that you can like relate to them a lot more. But there's lots of stuff out there that totally did like Hellboy, for example, which is really popular. He does, his eyes are just like white voids, you know? Um, but he's still really cool and an extremely popular comic. But I don't know. I think you don't have to copy the art style, but I would look for a lot of inspiration from Hellboy since it's a really dark comic about demons and stuff. And that's basically what Oni are kind of like Oriental demons. Um, I think that could be a good place to find, start looking for some inspiration and stuff for your, for your story. Um, I think what makes um, really great, interesting characters, especially in a visual format, is coming up with unique ideas. So like you said that you had looked at uh, Adrian Smith's Onis for Rising Sun. And those Onis are 
extremely like they're really visually interesting and unique like he doesn't just make like a giant demon character like every single one of them has something really unique to his design about it that makes it really interesting that you probably haven't seen before and i think trying to incorporate like what can you do your take like let's say you're doing the oni of um like i don't know if you're gonna have specific oni but let's say you're doing the oni of i don't know uh oni of lies let's say what can you do to make it you know what would be the physical embodiment of an oni of lies essentially you know what can you do to make that unique and yours and add a lot more visual interest than just a big huge troll ogre looking guy you know what what could you incorporate into his character that would make him unique for the reader Every time I draw from reference, I'm just like, man, it's been a long time. It feels like uh, it feels like when you go to the gym, and you haven't worked out in a long time, and it, you feel like super sore and stiff. But I can feel the improvement. Vita Locke is drawing people. Nice. I'm kind of like stylizing this almost a little bit, but it's just like, it's like begging to be stylized. <laughs> it's like so exaggerated. It's funny because even if you were to draw it exactly how the picture is, it would almost <laughs> appear to be stylized. Yeah, it would be hard to, it would be like, oh, that's a cool cat. You should draw it realistic. <laughs> yes, that's what it looked like. So Karma121983 says, what have you done the most studies of? Definitely animals. Um, specifically, probably. Uh, probably. I don't know. That's a good question. It'd be a toss up, I think, between felines and reptiles in particular um like i said i'll do a sketchbook review like a really detailed one sometime because i did one but I, it was really bad and i just went through all of my sketchbooks really fast and there's like years of work worth in there but um yeah if you look there's a lot of like studies of lion skulls and skeletons and tigers and stuff like that and then i drew a lot of snakes and things like that, because I wanted to draw dragons. But there's also other stuff, like there's um, a lot of like horse anatomy type things. Um, trying to think. I mean, it's a pretty good mix. It's a little bit hard to say which one was like definitively just flat out the most, but as a category, excuse me, overall, definitely animals, things like that. So that I, especially animal anatomy, have like pages and pages of skeleton studies and, and muscle studies and stuff like that, that there's just a ton of. So that'd be at the top of my list.
So I posted uh, just reminding people to feel free to ask you any questions that they have. And uh, the next comment right after that was how to not suck at drawing hands. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Really, though, I would say a big one, especially for things that are somewhat complicated forms. Because like here's a, when you look at a hand in your head, you think I know exactly what a hand looks like. I have hands. I see hands every day. But uh, we end up, what happens in our head is we, our brain a lot of times creates basically like symbols for objects and it simplifies them in our mind. So like to give you an example, whoops, that's not the thing I wanted to do. For example, let me just do this really quick before I get too distracted. For example, we all recognize this as a house, right? Like you look at that and you're like, totally, that's a little tiny house, you know, and you get a little chimney, right? But in real life, a house doesn't look anything like that. That's not what a house looks like. But it's close enough that we kind of symbolize it in our brain as a house. So then a lot of times we got to draw a hand and we're thinking like, okay, like I know it has five fingers and they come out from like the base. So it's probably like this and there's like a thumb and like, I don't know, like instead of thinking or looking and drawing what we uh, actually see, um, we draw what we think we see. Same with like someone's drawing a chair. Let's say they're drawing a chair. This is a problem a lot of beginner artists have or people who aren't artists at all when they want to draw something. They're just like, I just can't draw. They're trying to draw a chair and they know that the base of the chair is, let's say, a square. But really what they see is something more like this, which doesn't quite look like a square. But they know it's a square, so they're like kind of trying to draw it like this, because in their head they're like, "It's a square. I think I see a square." And then they're like, "Okay, and now I know it has four legs, so um, I'm gonna draw four legs." And I know that it looks like this, uh, and then those are connected, so I'm gonna connect all of those. And it has a back and that's square too. So it looks like this. And now they have a chair that doesn't really make any sense, whatever. You can kind of tell it's a chair, but it's because they're mixing what they see, what they actually see with what their brain is telling them a chair is. And hands, I think, is another one of those things where we think to ourselves, I know there's five fingers. I know my hand is shaped like this. And it's really hard to just get that out of your head and draw what you actually see until you understand it well enough that you can draw it from your head without getting confused with that kind of artificial knowledge, like that symbol in your head of a hand. Because um, really, if you're drawing a chair and you're probably looking at reference, it would look way more, you know, it'd be in perspective. The chair legs wouldn't all exactly come down to like the same length and like everything, you know, that's still a really shitty chair, but <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Um, it's the same thing, I think, with hands. That's another one of those common ones. And what I would do is, um, in order to kind of try and remedy that, I think, would be draw a lot from reference and try and make them really quick at first. Um, instead of spending a long time doing really, de really detailed ones, try and do kind of like gest gesture studies of hands. And I'm, in, by, by the way, no means an expert at drawing hands myself. Um, but when I have to do things like that, like especially something as expressive as a hand, because that can convey almost just as much motion in a character as their face, um, I try to focus on doing the gestures first before I get to any sort of detailed work. So that's my advice. Awesome. That's great. Sayoko is asking, um, I want to get into drawing short animations. I struggle with keeping everything smooth. Sometimes after drawing it a couple times, it changes shape or it gets smaller or bigger. How do I solve this? I have no idea. I don't ever animate. Sorry. I have a buddy. Uh, who does a lot of really great animation. He's done some work for Disney and uh, like Super Bowl ads and stuff like that. But he could tell you, I unfortunately could not. 
doing it would probably help to do like um draw orthographics of your characters so like let's say this will be real rough but let's say this is your character right you draw your character from a straight on side view and you have like a graph type thing draw it straight though not like this and then you draw the character again but from the side and you're trying to line it up with all the lines so you'd be like okay let's say let's put a line right here like bottom of his head right here so from the side his chin would line up in the same spot and his arms would be right here and end right there because the bottom of the line is there and the top right and then his legs start right here or whatever and then do the same thing from the back and from three-fourths view so that you have a accurate understanding of what they look like from all angles that is like perfectly lined up with each other and then that might help but as far as like the actual animating part i don't know any tips or advice to keep your animation consistent from frame to frame i bet you you can find some good stuff from aaron blaze though because i know he teaches some 2d animation uh courses and stuff like that on his site that his site is called creature art teacher i think maybe i'll get him on the show one day that'd be pretty cool All right, I'm going to go ahead and lower the opacity, make a new layer. We'll start cleaning up some of this line art. You probably have some good tips on drawing hands, Caleb. What do you think? What are some good ways to get good at drawing hands? You probably draw them a lot more than I usually do. Well, I'd say that breaking it down into basic shapes is the easiest for me because hands can be really tricky. And, um, and, and with anything, when you're sketching from a reference or drawing from a reference, um, like hands or, or anything like that, um, or, or even if you're not drawing from a reference, but you're trying to draw from memory, I'd say breaking it down into basic shapes is the best way to do it and uh, make make a good outline before you start adding detail because if you start adding detail too soon then you start to to focus more on the detail and less on proportions and less on um the relationship with the with the other parts and and things so then it all just kind of turns out um looking strange or, or skewed or having a weird you know uh, mm -hmm. having weird proportions. So it's really important to to just kind of block it out with basic shapes first. Yep, it's like I always tell you guys, start loose and then work tighter. I remember when I was like a, I would say more of like a beginner artist when I was like in high school and I would start out with way too much detail and then partway through kind of take a step back and realize that my proportions and stuff were off. But by that point, you're just like, you're so committed already to what you've put down that you don't end up going back and fixing it because you already put so much time and effort into the detail and stuff. And then it just ends up killing your, your painting or your drawing overall because you focus way too quickly on the details instead of worrying about the proportions and stuff. Direct French says, I think I chose the hardest pair of hands to draw. I'll try blocking up with shapes next time. Then um, Sophia is asking, are these sketching exercises meant only to be line drawing or is shading with a second tool part of it as well? Um, we want to focus on the, well, I mean, you can do whatever you want. 
for the sketch group, for the daily sketch grind group, what I want the focus to be in there for people to be able to kind of get feedback on and see other examples of is the drawing itself part. When you get into like a lot of shading and rendering and stuff like that, um, the focus becomes a lot more on the rendering side of things like light and values and stuff like that, which like I said, is not bad. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I want to do as we focus on this is focus on the drawing aspect, the draftsmanship of it. So really understanding the form um, through, you know, the line art and contours and stuff like that. So yeah, you can do whatever you want. Um, just especially when you're working digitally and you start shading, even if it's like a drawing, it, it basically just becomes a painting. Um, and I want to keep the focus on the drawing part. And honestly, even if you're really good at drawing, you can probably always still improve. Um, and the better you get your drawing, the better your paintings will be. So that's what this the focus of this is going to be. But if that's not, you know, if you need to, if you're like, you know, I really need to work on my lighting and my values, I don't know, maybe down the road we'll change it or open it up more. But for now, this is what I want to keep the focus on. Wage of War is asking, when you talk about fundamentals, what do you think is the most important to learn first? Anatomy, perspective, etc. Um, I think they all go kind of hand in hand and you should kind of try and look. I would say, okay, here, I would put anatomy towards the end of the list because it's in an, anatomy is not a fundamental of art. It's a fundamental of drawing people and figures, but as far as like art itself goes, that's not in the same category as lighting, form, um, line, stuff like that. So I would put that at the end of the list. Everything else like perspective, um, form, light, color, that stuff. Value. I would, yeah, value. I would put that all in the same category. It's, it's kind of like asking the question, what's more important for living, uh, breathing or eating? uh well if you don't have either one you die you can't just be like like you know what i mean so they're both important it's so i don't know i would say start with form would be my suggestion as like the fundamental like like understanding things in three dimension and drawing wireframes and like breaking things down into 3d shapes that's what I would do. And that's what I feel like helped me the most when I started. But I don't know. I would agree with you, Austin. I would think that uh, things like line and form are really important to start off. Um, you know, the value is great, but if you can't even, you know, if you're not, uh, if you don't feel comfortable enough with line and things like that, it's kind of hard to give it a real, three-dimensional feel and things like that. And and if you don't understand the form, you're not really going to understand why you're putting value where it goes. You know, like you'll be able to replicate stuff you see, but if you under, if you don't understand why it's like that, you know, like why certain services round and form a different way or, you know, different things like that, what direction they're facing, then you might be able to draw really well from reference, but it's going to be pretty hard to draw stuff out of your head with, you know, semi-accurate lighting and, you know, a sense of realism because you're not, you don't understand, you know what I mean? You don't understand, you can't look at what you're drawing in your head and see what its three-dimensional shapes are. Because you want to be able, like, if you're drawing, like, let's say, just to give a real simple example, you're drawing these two spheres and then we're looking at them straight, like, head-on. 
and no one making any boob jokes, okay? <laughs> um, and then in your head, you need to be able to turn those around and look at them from different angles. But now imagine, so it would be like, okay, well, this one's going to be in the front. Then the other one's going to be slightly behind it. And since it's perspective, it's going to be slightly smaller. And then those, um, the, uh, the line's going to be a little different because of that. And you need to be able to do that in your mind with much more complex shapes, I think, to be able to really draw stuff out of your head well. Um, otherwise, you'll have a difficult time making things look believable. I would say being able to draw, kind of just to add on what to what you said, uh, being able to draw what you see is crucial to be able to then draw from your head. If you, you know, if you can't draw what you see first, then you're not going to be able to just pull it out of your head. Yeah. So I think using at least, references, at least well, you're doing. Yeah. Cause like, I don't know, maybe in your head, you're like, I'm thinking of a stick figure. I could draw that in my head, even though I'm not drawing from reference. Right. But if you're trying to draw some, if you try, if you want something to look realistic or even like reference something realistic. Yeah. If you can't draw it from real life, you're going to have a way harder time pulling that out of your brain and putting it on paper as well. It would be like a like if you don't learn all of them, it's kind of like, I've made this analogy for, but you would kind of end up being an artist who's similar to someone who's memorized a couple songs on the piano, but they don't actually know how to read sheet music or compose anything. So it's like, you can't actually really play piano, but you can play some songs on the piano, you know? So it's really, I think, important to learn all of them. Now, Austin, I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, but I've noticed that for me, it's been really helpful to just understand the basics of um, the elements and principles of art and design. And that's kind of, I guess, the, the mainstream name for it. And that would be, you know, line, shape, form, value, space, color, texture, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I would I would recommend um, to to anybody um to to look up the elements and principles of design or of art and probably throw a composition in there if that's yeah. not one of them yeah yeah and there's a you know there are lists that that will explain um each one to you You've got uh, principles of, of art like rhythm balance emphasis proportion mm -hmm. gradation harmony variety movement things like that and that was something I found in two seconds just by looking up the elements and principles of art. I think that stuff is important, definitely. I think though that there are a lot of artists who, what's the word, I don't know, like almost obsess over it. Like almost like, they almost act like they can like create a formula to make the perfect piece of art, you know? And I think that you gotta be a lot more intuitive with that than that you know i think you can learn those things and that they're important and like to understand them because it does help you understand why a piece of art looks good when you look at it why you're like man why does that just like look so you know like appealing and stuff and it can really help you understand the psychology behind it but um yeah that stuff isn't bad to understand but i also think like with you can really still be quite successful and make great art without a formal study of that um 
and there's plenty of artists who as examples of that but um even if those artists like even if they haven't had a formal study of it, I'd still think a lot of them have it like almost an intuitive understanding for making so much art that you kind of understand, you know, when I repeat the shape, it looks really pleasing. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think that is like, a would be like help you a little more and take you a little bit further, but I would put the basics of art fundamentals themselves as a little bit higher priority and then start working on those other aspects of composition and rhythm and repetition and stuff like that. I'd say also looking at, at art from your favorite artists is a great way just to analyze it. Mm -hmm. look at it see why do you like it why is it uh why does it move you or why does it influence you yeah. and and then you can really get a lot from just studying art from your favorite artists yeah i agree with that now there's another question sayoko saying would you say it's normal to have multiple styles like a style for detailed art pieces and then simple art style for animation um I wouldn't worry about that too much, honestly. Um, I would worry about making a bunch of art that you really like, experimenting, exploring, and then your art style will kind of develop. And even if the techniques you use between paintings are different, like for example, a really good example of this is Bobby Chu. He kind of has what initially would seem like a pretty wide range of style. Like sometimes he does really simple sketches that are on like paper and they're really, really simple. But other times he does these really detailed, super colorful three or digital paintings. And sometimes he works digital and then paints over the top of it. And they're all, they have, they all have like a unique style to them but you still can very easily recognize it as his art almost instantly, even whether it's a little pencil sketch or whether it's a, a big painting because the, the content of the paintings and like the, the emotions that he conveys through them is doesn't matter what medium he's painting and it shows through either way really strongly. Um, I think the more people focus on discovering their style, the more they get farther away from it because it just feels really forced. And your style will kind of just develop naturally if you kind of leave it alone. It'll sort of come to you. And it will probably... Um, it'll probably evolve and change over time. Even people who are like really popular and have really distinct art styles if you look at their art throughout their career a lot of them it has not been the same throughout their whole career as they kind of evolve and go in different directions their art style even like artists like norman rockwell over time his art slowly changed and morphed to fit where he was at and his progression as an artist so i wouldn't sweat that the more art you make the more your style will start to emerge on its own so just focus on getting a bunch of stuff out there that would be be my advice would you say it's hard let's see samantha pixley is asking would you say it's hard for one to see one's own style i don't know i, I don't think that's like universally well, it's probably different for different people. Um, I don't know, like I when I look at my work, I don't see like a super obvious consistent style, but I can see similarities that are like, yeah, I can see like kind of like a theme that goes to my work. Other people might be able to do it maybe more than me or things like that, but um, I don't know. I don't think. I don't even really think it's a big deal. Like you, I know it seems really important because you look at your favorite artists and you're like, wow, like they have such a unique style and that's why they're so popular. If I had a unique style, I would be popular. 
but that's not really why they're popular. Uh, like, for example, Jake Parker, he has a huge social media following. A lot of people would say he has an extremely distinct style, but that's not why he's popular. He's popular because his art, one, he makes a ton of art all the time. Like, he's usually posting something, like, every day, um, sometimes maybe even twice a day. And his art usually evoke some sort of emotion whether it's like humor or wit or endearment um that's what makes him popular is when people look at his stuff it's not just like oh that's interesting it's like wow that's so cool or wow that's so funny or like um everyone's been doing these spider sauna spider personas or spider saunas whatever they're calling them um after the new spider-man movie which is really good by the way i recommend it that has some awesome art style and character design that's a good one to go check out um but everyone's been doing like these spider saunas where it's like they draw their persona as a Spider-Man character. Cause in the movie there's like alternate realities and, you know, different spider people from all over the universe or whatever. And uh, his was like, uh, he did like if Spider-Man was bitten by a radioactive daddy long legs. And so Spider-Man's arms and legs were like three times the length of his body he just had a couple of pictures of him like swinging, like what that would look like and different stuff. And it was just so bizarre and out there and funny. Like it was just so humorous imagining what that would look like and how impractical it was, but still in like were these really recognizable iconic poses of Spider-Man that um, it just got a lot of attention. Everyone really liked it because it was such a unique take. Um, and it wasn't because of his actual drawing style, like his techniques. It's really simple. It's just mostly ink drawings with some flat washes of color maybe a few gradients. It's not like amazing paintings. Um, it's because of the ideas and the emotions that he can like conveys through the, through the art. So I really think that if you're worrying about um, style, you're worrying about the wrong thing. Just make art that you like, that you enjoy. Like when you, you want to make art that when you look at it, you, it, you like looking at it. Um, if you don't like looking at your art, then what you need to be doing isn't trying to hone down your style, you should be working on the fundamentals and technique and stuff till you get art that you enjoy looking at that you're kind of like proud of, you know, it should be art that you want to hang on your wall. And that if, if you hadn't drawn it, would you still like it? Would you put it on your pin board? Or would you be like, eh? And by doing that, your style will kind of start to come out. Victor Von Bonbon bon says, hello. That's a great name, by the way. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, hello. Do you have a routine or warm-up you do before you start drawing? Uh, I just kind of like doodle <laughs> for my warm-up. I don't know. Maybe there's a better one out there, but I just kind of get myself loosened up so that I um not so tight with my first lines on whatever reference I'm drawing, but I just kind of let my pencil wander and draw whatever I want to do. Cause when you're doing a study or when you're sketching and stuff, you don't, you want to be drawing with a purpose. Even if you're drawing something out of your head, you don't want to just be kind of like, eh, whatever, I don't know. You want to draw with intention. Um, Cause that's how you're going to get better. But for your warm up, I'm just trying to get my pencil loosened up and get my arms and hands loosened up so that I'm, uh, can be making like clean lines and stuff like that. So I don't know, might be something better out there. I'm pretty sure Bobby Chu on his YouTube channel has some warm up exercises that are pretty good. I can't remember, but that's what I do. I just kind of doodle and get some lines out there on the paper. Honestly, I think that's great advice to just kind of draw whatever you, whatever you want, whatever you, you know, whatever comes to mind, because you don't want to be too technical about things, because that won't really help you loosen up, you know, so if you get too, too technical about the way you warm up or the way you do things, sometimes it, it turns it into more of a chore and less of a, of a fun, and enjoyable think, thing. And I think also, yeah, you don't want to like, especially if you're gonna be drawing reference or drawing a prompt even if you're doing it for fun, there's still a little bit of anxiety or like a little bit of pressure and stress to be like, okay, I got to make this, you know, and that can be overwhelming and deter a lot of people from just starting, you know, that anxiety, like when you think, when you think like, okay, I'm going to do sketch grind today, 
but oh then it's hard what if it turns out bad or what you know um and then you don't do it but if you know like okay i'm just gonna start out by just kind of doodling messing around there's no pressure there's no concern for whether or not it looks good or if it looks accurate to the picture that you're or any of that stuff and then once you get to that point suddenly it feels okay it's not so bad to start drawing a reference now like i'm already here i'm already drawing like a lot of that pressure i think starts to go away if you can start out with a warm-up that's real easy i feel like his eyes are not quite lined up eh. I can see a few tiny perspective problems, but overall it's actually not too bad. Do you want to explain while you're flipping it? Uh, yeah, so this just kind of helps your mind get like a, fit, a fresh perspective on it because when you look at something for a long time, it starts to, um, I don't know. I don't know the technical reason behind it. I just know that your brain starts to kind of, what the heck? Your brain starts to, why wouldn't it flip? What the heck's going on? There we go. Your brain starts to kind of ignore certain things. Like a good example of this is if you um, have ever done like a tongue twister, you say the same word over and over and over and over and over and over again, it starts to not sound like that word anymore. Like it kind of starts to morph and sound weird. It kind of like loses its meaning. Um, you can say butter, like 50, butter, 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 butter. It starts to sound like noise. And I think it's the same thing with your drawing when you're looking at something for a really long time. You can sort of, sort of start to lose its, I don't know what the word is. Just so it's all blend together. So flipping it kind of helps break that cycle. It makes it, your brain view it almost as a new image. And it makes it a lot easier to see any flaws. Yeah, I agree. That's helped me a lot in my artwork. And I'd say if if you're drawing on an actual piece of paper rather than drawing digitally, um, a way that you can do that, since you can't necessarily just flip your drawing just like you did, mm -hmm. um, what you guys can do is uh, you can turn it upside down. Look at it upside down is a great way to do it. And also you can hold it up to light because um, then you can see uh, through the back if you hold it up backwards so that the drawing is facing the light you can kind of see it in a backwards uh, perspective. And that that at least has helped me a lot. Or hold it up to a mirror. Yeah. Yep. That's another one. Um, so there are a bunch of questions that are coming in. So um, really quick, by the way, um, oh, yeah. I think we might go over on time a little bit today, which I'm OK with. I got some time. Are you OK if we OK? Yeah, of course. Then Feel free to leave if you guys got to go, but we're going to go over an hour today and just keep going until I finish this guy. So anyways, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so the, yeah, there are a few questions coming in. Um, I'm trying to improve and learn the perspective side of things and different ways to connect shapes. Would you suggest drawing robots as it's many shapes in different angles? Um... Actually, I would say no. I don't know. Maybe someone could convince me otherwise, but here's why I would say no. Because you want to, if you learn to just do that by drawing robots, and what's going to be likely to happen is that you're not learning how to break organic shapes down into those, into cylinders and spheres and stuff like that. And that's the whole point, right? Um, is to be able to look at anything and break that down into its basic shapes. And if you're only drawing robots, I think two things will happen probably is that you won't be able to do that because you're not working with organic shapes. And two, all of your robots will look really chunky and boring <laughs> because you're just drawing them as basic shapes. When in reality, I think a lot of the best robot designs actually simulate a lot more organic shapes than they do... Um, like, I don't know, like if you look at the Transformers, for example, from the Transformers movies, there's quite a bit going on there. They're not just like um, boxes and cylinders and spheres and stuff like that, but those are really awesome robot designs. Or um, 
some I'm trying to think of some other movies that have really good robot designs. Um, I know the Pacific Rim robots are pretty cool, and they're not just those things. And I think that if you're drawing robots with the intention of understanding form by using simple shapes, you're going to not learn how to break down organic shapes into those things, and your robots are all going to look really blocky and chunky. So, like, it seems like they'd end up just looking like the robots from, like, the, the Transformers from, like, the animated series where their chest is, like, a big, huge rectangle and their head is like basically a box and you know what i mean and if that's the art style you want to go for then do that but um if you're trying to understand form so that you can draw it better and understand form in your drawings and stuff i think that will actually possibly hurt you more than it would help you i i think the best way is to look at reference photos of things and then trace up like this is what I would do. And this is what I teach in my courses. This one of the assignments is to do this. You get like 10 pictures of stuff and you create a new layer on top of your reference photo. And then you have to break it down into its forms by tracing over it. And then you start doing it without tracing. And you're trying to be like, okay, so I know here's like the outline of the shape, the head is gonna come down here. Um, you know, like the nose, right? And then basically break it down like that um, instead of doing it just by freehand right off the bat because you can, it's easier to see sort of. This isn't like a great example. I would normally be taking quite a bit more time, but um. Something like that, basically, if that makes sense. And breaking it down as accurately as you can into, oops, into 3D shapes. Um, that's what I would do. I think that's a good assignment to help with that. Awesome. What's the best way to clean up your lines? Mine are pretty messy. It's coming from George French. Um, well, I would... One way is obviously using an eraser afterwards to clean it up, but I don't usually encourage that because then you can get into a bad habit of just being obsessed with erasing and making everything perfect. And that really can start to slow down your workflow. I would say a better way is to um, draw a lot looser. This is one of the worst things I see in beginner Oh, I just glimpsed at the chat. Horizon Zero Dawn does have some awesome robots. Um, beginner art, it's, I call it fuzzy line. It's the worst thing ever. And I used to do it all the time. I was like one of the biggest culprits of it, which is I would see art, like maybe like this art, for example. I'd see artwork like this and see like, oh, it's pretty sketchy. Like I really like that sketch quality that it has to it where it's loose and you can see a lot of the line work, you know? And I'd be like, I want to draw art like that. So I would start drawing and I would be going like this a lot. That's a big brush. Let's bring it down a little bit. I'd be drawing and be like, draw lines like this. Like if I wanted to outline stuff. And I call that fuzzy line because it just looks like a fuzzy line. And that's bad, 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 bad. Unless you're specifically trying to draw fur, then draw fur. But if you're just sketching and your lines look like this really fuzzy sort of thing, I don't know if you ever drew like that, Caleb. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Um, that's the worst. Stop doing that right now. And instead... <laughs> Because that means you're really drawing from the wrist and you kind of want to draw more from the elbow. So if you were to keep your wrist relatively stiff and move your elbow instead, you're able to get a lot more flowy lines that don't look quite as sketchy. Because that already, I think, looks a lot better than drawing a circle like this. Right? And the li your line's all broken up. It doesn't look very smooth. This looks a lot smoother and more organic than doing it the other way. And then on top of that, um, so draw from your elbow and then start loose. Like we were talking about earlier, you gotta start way loose. You don't wanna start jumping in with the details because it's gonna make you really stiff. You wanna start with the basic shapes um, that you're seeing like for the cat, for example, I started with like basically the basic shape of the head and the basic shape of the mouth, right? And that's gonna, that alone, I think, would make a huge difference. And then the last thing I would do 
is um practice drawing circles and lines super boring not fun at all but if you can master drawing circles and lines you'd be pretty impressed with how big of a difference it is um i did this after reading oh what is it scott it's on my shelf over there what is it it's that red one that says how to or the orange one that says how to draw on the very end you see that one who's that by the that shelf right there the orange and white Scott, is Scott something? Scott Robertson. Okay, yeah. Scott Robertson, um, that book's awesome. And in it, he's like, he says, like, do hundreds of studies of drawing circles and straight lines until you can draw a perfectly straight line without a ruler. Yep, that's someone already said it in the chat. Until you oh. can draw a perfectly straight line without a ruler and a pretty straight, pretty smooth ellipse without any sort of guides. Um, and doing that over and over again so that your lines are pretty smooth, like, I could probably use some work. But drawing parallel lines, oh, my hand slipped on that one. Oh my gosh. And drawing ellipses, those are pretty terrible. Um, but uh, doing that is pretty helpful. That would be a good recommendation for getting cleaner lines. And just practice, practice, practice. You pro Here's the thing. You probably need to be drawing, if you really want to get good, you need to be drawing like five times as much as you probably are. You might already be doing it, but like, I'm talking like six hours a day. Take your sketchbook everywhere, your iPad, whatever it is. If you work on like a desktop for your digital painting, then grab a sketchbook and take that with you everywhere and be drawing as much as possible so that it become so things become a habit to you. Um, that would be the best advice I could give, honestly. What inspires you when you have artist block? I don't ever have artist block, and it's not because I'm a superhero <laughs> or I'm magic. It's because I recognize that artist block is a bullcrap made up excuse that a lot of people use to not draw. Now, before I get blazed at the city square for saying that, <laughs> let me explain. In that, if you're an artist, especially if it's like your profession, that doesn't fly. Like, <laughs> you can, if you're a concept artist, you can't just come into work one day and just be like, oh man, I know I got to come up with some designs for some creatures, but just got that damn artist block like sucks i know it's i i hate it too i wish i could be working but you know i just can't it's ridiculous i mean like an accountant for example would never go in to his job and be like sorry i just can't work today i got accountant's block um now yeah sometimes it's hard to come up with good ideas but that's not the thing with artist block is it kind of implies that like it's out of your control. Something is just stopping you, you know, that it's taking away your accountability and your ability to kind of choose what you're going to do and what your actions are going to be. And that's just not the case. You could say I'm having like a difficult time coming up with a good idea. Sure. Um, the way to deal with that, like I, I made this analogy like a couple days ago is it's like the, um, when you turn on the faucet and the water turn, runs brown, you know, um, it's the solution isn't just to turn the faucet back off and be like, well, that sucks. The water's brown. I guess I'm going to, I'll wait until it turn it on again a little later and see if it runs clear again. It's not going to work. If you're going to turn it on, it's still going to run brown. The way to make sure that it runs clear is to let the brown water run until it turns clear. And with your art and really anything, I think, um, you got to get through those crappy drawings, those crappy inspiration droughts, whatever you want to call them, and just let the water, your drawings might suck. Like when we started the sketch grind, I knew that my drawings were not going to be at the level I wanted them to be in my head. Um, but that just waiting for them to get to the level I wanted was never going to happen. The only way was to start drawing, even though the first ones were going to stink until they started to not stink. Like this one, for example, I actually really like this drawing. Um, 
I think it's really fun. I felt good drawing it. I enjoy looking at it. Um, but I never would have been able to draw this if I hadn't started earlier last week with some of the, the crappier ones. So, um, yeah, artist block, I think you should cancel that out of your mind as in as an option, just be like, there's no such thing as artist block. There's only such thing as me being lazy and perhaps maybe having a difficult time coming up with good ideas. Time to start drawing so that I can get to the good ones. So yeah, that's my thoughts on artist block. Luis Ortega is saying, speaking of books, which ones do you recommend about drawing? Um, about drawing, like how to draw books. I think there's better information online because it's better to like see someone as they draw, in my opinion. Um, it's kind of hard to understand that through a book. But out of the books that are out there on how to draw, I would definitely say uh, How to Draw by Scott Robertson. It, it's honestly mostly a book about perspective, how to draw perspective for the huge majority of it, but it's still really good. Um, the, uh, what's it called? Successful Drawing by Andrew Loomis or Drawing the Head and Hands by Andrew Loomis. All of Andrew Loomis's books are awesome. Um, it's a really old book from like, I think like the 1920s or something like that, but he is a master. Those would probably be the big ones, I'd say. Um, and then as far as books that just have really great drawings in them, um, my favorite book of drawings probably all time. I don't know. I might find the one to replace it someday. But at this point, my favorite one is Shadowline by Ian McKaig. Um, man, that is so cool. It has got such good drawings in it and Amy Cake's a concept artist who he's like an old school concept artist who did a lot of work for he worked on the prequels of Star Wars he worked on um this is not that old school like from the 90s late 80s he worked on Hook you know the Peter Pan movie with like Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman he worked on I'm trying to remember his stuff is just it's so good um and it's mostly drawings. This very, like some of his stuff has color. Like he'll do a color wash or do a little bit of color in Photoshop after he draws it in pencil. But that guy has probably my favorite drawings. Favorite drawings of all time. Um, Kim Jung Ji has Kim Jung Ji. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, South Korean guy with some. He is a. I'd say he's probably the best draftsman in the world. Creative draftsman in the world. Um, honestly, if you look at his stuff, he's just prolific. Like you can buy sketchbooks of his that are like 400 pages thick. Um, and he has like five of them out that are just pages of his sketchbook in McCaig, not McKay. Oh, it's M C K A I G. No, no, no. M C C A I G. M C C A I G. A I G. Yeah. And I think it's, it might even be Ian, like I A I N. I don't know. The book's over there. It's that one with the girl on the spine. It's like black. It's called Shadowline. Yeah, that one. Maybe I'll do a, like a bookshelf tour for one of my videos these days and show you some of my favorite art books and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if you guys would be interested. You might be like, why Why are you showing us this? We don't care. <laughs> but if you're interested, let me know. I would be willing to do that. And what was the other artist that you just mentioned? Uh, Kim Jong... Kim Jong Ji? It's K I, I think it's K I M J U N G G I. I don't know. Google him. Yeah. You 
GI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a real master. I mean, man. If you're looking for good online content on drawing uh, Proko, Stan Proko Pango has stuff. I teach a course on digital sketching on Udemy that you can buy $10 all through the month of January. Um, I saw you responded, Samantha, I understand that you just need to keep drawing, but do you have any tips on how to inspire yourself? And you also said, okay, that's a very good point. Let me rephrase, do you find inspiration around you, especially when you were feeling low on creative energy? Um, I don't know. It might sound harsh, but I think most of the time that's just an excuse. Like, and this is just, I mean, this is from personal experience from my own self and other artists around me. Um, creative energy is not like finite. It's not like you run out of it. It's you have as much as you're willing to generate for yourself. And you just, I don't know, you just kind of do it. Like you just sit down think of an idea and just start drawing. And I think a lot of times we're like, we don't get super excited about an idea right off the bat. And so we're like, oh, I'm just not inspired to do it. I'm just not motivated. I just don't have the passion. Like who cares? Like just draw it. Like you don't need to be like head over heels, life goal dreams about every drawing you make. Just start drawing, just draw all the time. And some of them you'll think are amazing and you'll want to draw more of and other ones you'd be like, all right, well, that was an okay drawing, but you just gotta, you just gotta start doing it. Just get it out there, start making some art. And I don't really think motivation is something that comes externally. For, I think it's mostly internally generated. And that the more, the more that you start acting and drawing and doing things, the more you become motivated. I don't think the more you become motivated, the more you start drawing. It's kind of, I think that's backwards. Um, and uh, that would be my advice. I know it's kind of like not probably, it's not like that magic ticket answer or some secret technique, but you just, gotta, you just gotta do it. Just wake up and be like, you know what? This is non-negotiable. I'm just effing drawing today. I don't care if I don't have any good ideas or if it seems hard or it doesn't seem fun, I'm just going to freaking do it. And then you make yourself do it. Renzo is asking, is Proco good for beginners? Fundamentals, et cetera, as there, as there are so many out there, but so many teach different things. Yeah, Proco is awesome for beginners. I'd say that's probably, uh, if you're completely new to drawing, and you're wanting to improve, I'd put Proko at the top of the list as the best online resources for learning how to draw. And it's um, it's free. You can, they do have online courses that are paid that are like hours long and they're like hundreds of bucks to buy the course. So it's, it can get a little pricey if you do the paid stuff, but I'd say they're totally worth it. If you go through that course and you do all the assignments and you turn them in and get the feedback and post them in the forums, you'll be able to learn how to draw in like a year, like real, really draw. I don't just mean like, um, you know, doodle or whatever, like your art will, be, you will understand how to draw very well. But if you can't afford that, even the free stuff that he has on YouTube or like the demos you can take are still uh, really fantastic. Comical Foods is asking, what are your thoughts on work for higher design work? Um, maybe you can clarify what you mean a little bit more. I'm not sure I understand that. What are my thoughts on, what was it? Say it again. Higher design work, higher H-I-R-E design work. I'm guessing what are my commissioned work. What work or, for I'm... higher design work? Yeah, I don't really understand exactly what you're saying. I have to clarify a little bit more for me to answer that one.
all right, after I finish this, I want to go through and kind of walk you through my brain of what are some of the things that as I drew this, I stored in my mental library that I know that I can reference later that was like going through my head that I was like, oh, okay, I didn't notice that before. Next time I draw something similar to this, I'll keep that in mind. So after we finish that, I want to go through that and point those things out to you guys. Okay, so they clarified. Comical Foods is saying, do you prefer work for hire or creator-owned work? Like, I don't know, like consuming or <laughs> like mm -hmm. I'm still kind of like personally, like what do I like to do? Um, I, I mean, it just depends if the work for hire is really awesome. Then I'm like, yeah, sure. Like if. I was going to do work for Wizards of the Coast and do like some magic cards that were just really cool, like maybe some sick dragons or something like that. I'd be like, sure, I really like that. Typically, though, I don't really do any uh, freelance work anymore unless it's like an awesome gig that I'm really excited about because um, not. it's partly because I like drawing my own things and I don't want to have to deal with having to meet what a client wants all the time. And that's not that bad to me though. What I really don't like is the idea of having to trade time for money where it's like, cause it's like you only have so much, you have a finite amount of time every day, which means you're going to cap on like how much income you can generate for yourself. And if you can figure out ways to generate income passively or at least semi passively, you no longer have to be trading time for money, which means you can spend your time doing other things you like more instead, like drawing or painting or spending time with your family or, you know, going on hikes or whatever. Like, um, that's the main reason I don't like doing freelance work is because it takes up a lot of my time and the value I get in return is not worth enough to me to justify it most of the time. So... That's where I'm at with it, honestly. As far as like consuming content goes, like when I like look for inspiration, I don't think it really matters. Good art is good art, whether it was hired or done because someone liked it, in my opinion. So. Kamaku Foods says, thanks. I'm working on creating my own intellectual properties and your videos are a great help for creature designs. Oh, awesome. Cool, man. I'm glad I could be of service. Keep it up. That's one of the best ways to not only improve, but get attention for yourself is by making actual projects instead of just, you know, either doing assignments or, you know, drawings without a reason behind them creating like a kind of like a mock product or, you know, package product, like a, you know, like a set of characters that could be for like a theoretical game or movie or, you know, a poster or something like that is a lot better than just doing a bunch of drawings that are unconnected or, you know, stuff like that. Do you find that freelance work slash commissions improved your skills as an artist at first? Um, yeah, but I don't think it was exclusively tied to doing commission work. It was just, I mean, you could simulate that same growth experience on your own. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing commission work. I also don't think it's like necessary to become a successful artist. Um, does give you an idea of how to work with clients which is not a bad thing to know 
but um the reason it for like let's say someone like i've had i had someone hire me they're like hey i want you to paint my dad he's a cowboy and i want you to paint a picture of him in the snow on his horse or whatever and i never painted snow and i never painted a cowboy so it forced me to learn how to do both of those things um in order to meet the client's needs that i wouldn't have done otherwise possibly but if i really needed to i could just learn be like, I want to learn how to paint snow and then do that without a client. I also typically think it's better to, um, there's a saying I really like called learn to the task, not the test. What it means is that when we learn information for the explicit sake of, you know, just to know it, just for like a test, for example, like at school is a perfect example of when you learn information at school, you're almost always learning to the test, not the task. Learning to the task means that you're learning it because you need to use it to do something. So like if you're learning how to do carpentry because you decide you want to build a entertainment center for your house, you're going to retain way more of that information and you're going to learn it way faster and it's going to be a lot more valuable to you. If you're learning carpentry because you need to get a uh, elective credit in high school and that was the least miserable sounding one or you know whatever it is out of all the ones or it seemed like it'd be the easiest to get an a even if you might enjoy it you're not going to retain nearly as much information because you're simply learning to the test not the task so with like the freelance stuff the reason why it was i learned it so valuably and so quickly is because i had a task attached to it that i had to learn in order to complete that task and so i was really motivated to do it and um, i retained a lot more of the information but if I was learning to the uh, to the test, it would be like, oh, well, I'm just going to arbitrarily make myself learn this, which is, I mean, learning is always better than not learning. So if you're learning to the test, I don't want to diss that and say, like, you should stop. Just stop teaching yourself stuff or learning things. That's not <laughs> bad. But the idea that, like, if you don't learn all this stuff in school before you go out into the real world, then you're just going to be screwed is ridiculous because there's no reason why you can't learn it when you need to know it. Um, you'll retain it a lot. But, I mean, they've done studies that show, like, the retention rate in schools is, like, less than 20% on the stuff taught um, within, like, three years of learning it or two years or something like that. Might have even been even less. I can't remember. But that basically means that you forgot... 85% of the stuff you learned in school within a couple years of learning it. And you spent like 15 or more years there um, versus when you learn to the task, you retain about 80 to 90% of what you learned um, because there's relevance that your brain is picking up on. Cause when you learn to the test, what your brain does is it remembers information. Then you take the test or you, you know, pass it off or whatever, it uses up its usefulness. And then it's just like, don't got room for this. It's not important. And your brain just basically ejects it out of its memory versus um, versus learning it for a specific task. Your brain labels it as a higher priority and it will stick around a lot longer. I have no idea if this is going to look good and if this is what I want to do, but or if I'm just going to end up getting rid of all these hash marks in the back, but we're going to find out. That's one of the great things about working digitally is you can just turn off the layer and. Well, I didn't do it on a separate layer, but I should have. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that after I was almost done. I was like, well, too late now. We're committed. <laughs> I can undo though. Um, now. Let's see. We've got another question. Do you have any ambitions for creating your own IP projects besides educational videos? Yeah, um, they're probably a little bit more long term. I have one idea that I've been working on for uh, several years that I haven't decided whether or not I want it to be. For a while, I wanted to be animated, like an animated series um, or movie or comic book. Wasn't sure. Not, I'm still not sure yet where I want to go with it about uh, a girl and her sister who, I don't know. It's a big thing. <laughs> it's, it'd, be, it'd be like a oriental sort of fantasy world with, um, you know, it's actually, 
it's ironic that Sayako that you were talking about that because I have a story that has like Onis and monsters in it and stuff like that and um about this girl and her sister and how she has to rescue her sister from these evil Onis and fight them off and stuff um I don't know what do you guys think hash marks or no hash marks I can probably do this and put it on a separate layer so we can switch between and see but anyways um that's one idea the other one that's a little bit more in the forefront that I've been working up towards I've actually posted some of the ideas I've had on some of my YouTube videos before but um a board game with a I want to, I'm working on designing a board game that um, I want to do all the art for that would be involving like different tribes um, fighting or trading in order to become the alpha tribe set in sort of like prehistoric ish time. So it's like dinosaurs, but with a little bit of a fantasy spin on it so that they're not like a uh, they're like inspired by real dinosaurs, but they're a little bit more fantastical. Like the, the I did one on layer masks, a video like in the last month, and I drew a parasaur with like a bunch of like like tribal looking armor on it and like gear on its back, and you had six legs instead of four, and like some extra spikes and stuff like that, that sort of thing. Um, I want to do art for that, and it would probably have like a a story involved, but um. Yeah, that would be probably the two biggest ones. I have some other ideas floating around, but people think the cat looks great. All right. Well, tell me what and... you think. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I like the hash marks, but that's it's totally up to you. All right. Let's see. Let's turn off this. What the heck just happened? Oh, that didn't do it on a separate layer like I thought it did. Pretty lame. So if that's, I can't duplicate it to a new layer. No, it did. Did I accidentally delete that layer? Weird. Okay, well, it's there now. So let's delete, erase all this stuff. So anyways, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the AP I got. I, for a while, actually, I was working on a comic book, but I decided to put it on the back. Well, actually, <laughs> this is what really happened. I was working with a writer. We were making a comic book. We were going to submit it to like Dark Horse or Impact or something like that and see if we could get it published. Uh, and it was a really cool story. I just realized I effing hate drawing the same thing over and over and over again like it was not fulfilling it was not fun i was just like this is the worst ever <laughs> and i was just like nah comic books aren't for me i'd rather do if i do it in the future and still make a story it would probably be more like an illustrated like full-on digital paintings really detailed like a basically an adult picture book not adult because it's like got a bunch of naked ladies and whatnot in it, but because it's just would be heavier, like a novel. Um, like, I don't know if you guys have seen Above the Timberline or kind of like Denotopia, maybe, but not quite aimed at kids. But anyways, it was about a cowboy named Bo who had married an Indian woman and was kind of like brought in into this Indian tribe who uh, he and he's like an alcoholic and stuff. He's not a very good father or husband and um, he's kind of, an outcast in this tribe um because he's he's like a european he's a white guy right a cowboy and um but he lives there because his wife wants to still she wants to be part of her tribe and stuff so he's there with her and uh they have a son and he he's an alcoholic and so one day he's in town and this guy comes through this like this kind of sort of eccentric german collector of cryptozoology specimens you know hunting down different various mythological lore and creatures from different countries like you know he's got what look like fairies and stuff in jars and like this traveling wagon thing and he meets um he meets Bo, and here's his tribe is um especially distinct because they worship fossils and like dinosaurs and stuff like that 
Um, and so he finds Bo, tracks him down when he's at the bar and basically gets him super drunk and convinces him to take him to where his tribe is because he tells him he wants to just ask him some questions and stuff. So he does. He's super drunk and can't do anything. And basically this German guy raises his village um, and kidnaps a bunch of people as like specimens for his weird traveling thing, whatever. So Bo's like feels really horrible. The tribe warrior like is really mad at Bo. And so they basically tie him to a geyser, the, t- the opening of a geyser and leave him and basically say, oh, it's up to the gods. Like if you're meant to live, you'll live. And if not, then this is your punishment, you know, because now they kidnapped a bunch of people in their village. So he, uh, the, he falls into the geyser or whatever while he's in there. There's like a T-Rex fossil. It's all like magic and it like forms and the gods have, he's like this chosen guy or whatever. And, um, he basically gets a second chance to go. His wife gets killed during the fight. So he's like, hates himself now because he's alcoholic and that's the reason it happened, but they kidnapped his son. So now the dinosaur forms into like a real dinosaur that's like alive. And the dinosaur, he names the dinosaur Angus. It's like a T-Rex, but like a, it's like a miniature T-Rex. It's not like full size. It's like, it's big, but like half the size. So, um, yeah, that's basically the story. It's about Bo. The cowboy's name is Bo, and the T-Rex's name is Angus. It's called Bone Angus, and it's about Bo and Angus hunting down, tracking, trying to find his son, and then it would probably evolve from there. More stuff could happen, but it's about Bo and Angus finding his son. It would basically be like a redemption arc story of Bo dealing with his kind of self-loathing and hatred for what he for being responsible for this and feeling like, um, I guess, kind of like undeserving since he's not even really an Indian yet. The gods of this tribe chose him to do this. And then um, the, um, and then kind of the other story, the main villain, there's a German guy, but then there would also be this, um, there's an Indian who's like his, his best friend, who's like the best warrior in the village that he's like friends with but he always loved Bo's wife never said anything about it though because she picked Bo um but then when Bo gets drunk and like is responsible for this and kills her he gets really mad and basically begs the god to like give him the power to stop them and rescue the woman who he loves son and instead they choose Bo which just kind of like pushes him over the edge into darkness so he goes to like the dark gods of his belief system and they do give him power and he gets like creepy zombie skeleton raptors like a pack of them and his so one of them is like a redemption arc and then his story simultaneously is like a tragedy arc um so that's super in depth there you go um (laughs) (laughs) but yeah maybe someday maybe someday anyways all right I was just kind of noodling this while I was talking. So let's see. What do you guys think? Cross hatching? No cross hatching. Ooh, okay, so we've got some different suggestions here. Comical Food says no hatching. Kiersey says hatching. Vita Lock, uh, Lock says cross hatching with 50% opacity. George French says cross hatching. That's not a bad idea. Let's see what happens if we lower the opacity. I actually like it lower than 50%, like almost barely visible. I think it looks nice. But the, that's it. That's all we're going to do because I can already feel myself starting to get into the realm of rendering like, ooh, and if I did the, if I did this, I could make that a different value. And so we're just going to call that good there. But um, I think that turned out pretty nice. That's fun. Oh, yeah. So this is what I wanted to go over really quick. Um, let me just center it in the space more. Okay, so... 
here's what I was thinking about and what I learned as I was doing this. Um, bring that down a little bit too. Um, I'll make a new layer so I can like circle stuff and point things out. Okay, so a couple of things that um, either refreshed my memory or just that I was able to add into my visual library was the angle and perspective of these ears, how much it's actually visible, right? So he has his ears a little bit flat against his head and he's at a little bit of a three-fourths angle, but he's looking pretty straightforward yet it still made a huge difference in how much of this ear is visible versus how much of this ear was visible. If I was drawing this for my head, I would know that I probably would have drawn this ear way too big. Um, the other thing was, even though I afterwards was like, I wish I would have drawn those better, but I still noticed it when I was drawing that these stripes up here, how they foreshorten because the top of his head is flat and that the way that these are drawn is what helps send the message that this part of his head is kind of flattening out and not just facing it straight on. Um, that the way, the way that these are kind of foreshortened is what makes it feel like that, those marks on his head. Um, another thing was, uh, let's see. Oh, just how small these teeth are. Um, I think I have a tendency to draw teeth too big. And when I really looked at it and was comparing it to other features in the face, I realized, well, those are really tiny. They're not nearly as big as I would have thought they were. And I can keep that in my mental library so that when next time I draw something, or if I'm, especially if I'm drawing a feline, I can think, okay, uh, those probably aren't going to be that big. I mean, I could stylize and make them bigger if I wanted, but you know. Um, and then. There was one more thing that I was specifically thinking of that I wanted to mention, which was, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember. I don't know, I can't remember. Those are some big ones. Now that I'm like really looking at this, I stopped drawing, I see so much stuff that I'm like, I need to fix that. <laughs> the perspectives and proportions aren't perfect. But like I say every time, that's why we're doing this. We're slowly getting faster and faster and better and better. Um, improving yeah misking whiskers that's because in order to draw the whiskers the whiskers are white and i mean maybe i could try them but the whiskers would be have to be erased away and there's not enough of a valued background for it to make oh i guess we can draw some whiskers let's see what doesn't quite have the same effect though as if they're white whiskers, but cats with their eyebrow whiskers. I was, this is such a sad story. I shouldn't tell it. You guys would think I'm a horrible person. It wasn't my fault. I'll tell it. The other day I was like, I was downstairs with my dog and he was like laying down next to me and I stood up. I didn't step on him, but I my foot was next to his face and I stepped on a bunch of his whiskers because he was laying down on the ground, which is like, fine. That wasn't the problem. The problem is that when I got up, he decided he wanted to get up too. And he just ripped <laughs> down a bunch of whiskers. Uh, I felt really bad because uh, now I'm worried he's going to be running into stuff that you can't feel. But he didn't seem perturbed. He didn't even like flinch or do anything. I felt really bad. So, I don't know. I mean, I guess we can leave the whisk because it's not. I don't know. I'm, in, I'm not going to put him in there. I think it looks better without him. It keeps it nice and clean and simple. It would be better. If, yeah, I'm actually going to leave him. Um, all right. Well, we are done then. So, um, yeah, we went way longer than I thought we were. But thanks for joining us today. Be sure to, uh, like always, post this stuff in the sketch group. Caleb will post that link again in the bottom just in case anyone came in late. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, use hashtag sketch grind on Instagram. And today, I promise I'm going to be posting some work. So post what you did. See if you get featured. And we will see you guys tomorrow with, uh, with a new prompt. So you guys have a great one.